happening now. We want to welcome our viewers from across the United States and around the world. This is the EdTech Situation Room. Good morning, good day, good evening. My name is Jason Neifer, and I am the Assistant Director and Curriculum Director of the Montana Digital Academy. I'm joining you from what right now is evening time from fabulous Missoula, Montana, where it's a cool 43 degrees and we expect it to freeze either tonight or tomorrow night for the second or third time this season. And joining me from all the way in Oklahoma, Dr. Wes Fryer. Good evening, Wes. How are you doing this evening? Good evening. I am doing well. I heard rumors of maybe a freeze this weekend, but it'll just be the mildest of, of mild touching uh, um, the, uh, the the freezing point if it happens. So we, I heard, I heard several people complaining about the cold today, and I thought, you know, these folks do not know what it is like to be in the north. So have you guys had a dowsing of, of snow already or not uh, yet? We've had some light, wet snow go in and out the last four or five weeks or so, but we haven't had a real dump yet. Um, I was did some traveling a couple weeks ago to see my parents, and there was a couple of mountain passes that had a, a pretty healthy dump of wet snow. But uh, for now, we're approaching late October. Um, we expect there to be a pretty serious storm pretty quick, but the forecast for at least the next week and a half, it's like just cold and, and maybe a little icy, but it'll come. Well, very good. For those of you that may not know, we are here usually on Wednesday nights, generally um, at 8, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, although sometimes we, we have a few issues, and uh, we're always glad to be joined live by some folks. And if you are viewing us live, we would encourage you to check out the chat room that we have to the side of the YouTube uh, live broadcast. You can find our link, edtechsr.com slash links. And we generally have a few more than we have time to talk about, although I was pretty amazed how many we covered uh, the, last, the last week. And uh, I, did, I put in a subtitle. We have subtitles sometimes on the show notes that don't make it, um, or rather on the Google Doc that don't make it necessarily to the podcast show notes. But uh, I did have a, a category that I said, you know, other exciting tech news that is not scary because, you know, sometimes it feels like, and this week in, you know, uh, whatever the world is ending, um, you know, stories go. My, maybe my brain is not working with that. So, Jason, where would you like to start? We do have some some positive and exciting things along with our typical dose of, uh, of hacking security news this week. Sure. Well, um, I want to kind of create a story where I've pulled some things from different locations and come together with, with, with a theory that I have that I'm pretty sure someone else has come up with before, but, but it was news to me. So um, I was on uh, my trusty Android phone last night, and I was offered early access to the Edge browser, which is the new Microsoft browser that appears in Windows 10, or it appeared in Windows 10 uh, when it was released two years ago. And now it's becoming a mobile browser. And so I installed it last night and um, played with it for a bit. And it was, you know, uh, a mobile browsing experience. I wouldn't say it was any better or worse than the other options available, like uh, mobile Safari on iOS devices, Chrome on iOS devices, Chrome on the Android platform, or Firefox on, on either platform. But what's really interesting to me is that a couple weeks ago, you heard it here that mo where Windows Phone was going away, and in fact that uh, a mobile operating system is, is effectively dead. Uh, there have been releases of new versions of it for those that are part of the Windows Phone faithful, all three of you. But there was a, uh, an interesting thing that's happened with the uh, advent of the mobile Edge browser. It is my theory that Microsoft is working hard to create Android as a Microsoft phone platform. And my theory is based on a couple of different things. First, um, I took a, a, um, an Android phone that I, I had laying around. And yeah, I'm kind of that guy, sorry. But um, and I, I reset it uh, tonight, and I started installing only Microsoft apps on it. And there is a Microsoft ecosystem here that you may or may not know about if you yourself are not using um, Office 365, either the personal or, or, or education version. You can download on an Android phone the Edge browser, which becomes your web browser, Outlook, which becomes your email client, and Microsoft now has a launcher. And for those of you that are unaware of the Android ecosphere, 
um, Android has a cool thing to where you can change a lot of the way your phone functions by downloading a different launcher. And now that there is a Microsoft launcher, which a lot of Android sites say is one of the best launchers available, you can effectively create a Windows phone experience, including Cortana, on your Android phone. And what's very interesting to me is if you happen to be in a district that's gone all in on Microsoft 365 for education and you'd like to have your phone be steeped in that universe and you are using an Android phone, it's possible to replace the standardized browser with Edge, the Google launcher with a Microsoft launcher, um, the Google Assistant with Cortana, and have all these things work together much like a Windows phone would, giving you essentially a Windows device that allows you to access the whole cloud ecosphere um, and ignore the Android underpinnings of the phone. Now, you, you may remember, for those of you that are super phone geeks, at one point, Microsoft bought Nokia and has uh, ultimately sold a lot of the parts off, including the name, to others. And they took a massive write-off a couple years ago because the, that, that effort to do something with Nokia didn't really go anywhere. But one of the rumored devices that was talked about at the time was a phone that had an Android underpinning, but all of the functional apps replaced Microsoft alternatives. And it appears that that is now possible if you buy even an off-the-shelf Android or Android phone. As an example, my spare Android phone is one of the cheap, mic or I'm sorry, Amazon phones that comes with subsidies from Amazon. I was able to uh, replace the Google Assistant with Cortana. I replaced the Google um, uh, launcher with a Microsoft launcher, and the integration is so tight that text messages from this phone now appear on Windows 10 machines where I'm signed in a Microsoft, Microsoft account. So if you happen to be in a district that has gone the Office 365 route and you've been disappointed at the integration available on your iOS or Android device, with that ecosphere, it appears that relief is coming for you while still being able to access the massive Android store. So lots of blah, blah, blah for me, but that's, that's kind of what I put together. And I put some articles um, in this week's chat about it, uh, the, or this week's show notes, which by the way are edtechsr.com, where you can see all the links that, that are kind of informing our, our discussion of the week. But it appears that you can recreate a Microsoft phone in the aggregate on an Android experience. So Wes, the question to you, sir, are you gonna run out and buy an Android phone so you can paint yourself Microsoft colors? Well, not for that reason, but hopefully so all my, my uh, critical classified information isn't sucked off by Egyptian um, you know, customs and, and US customs officials later in the month of November. I, I am gonna still you know, go for that burner phone. I do think it's fascinating. And one of the things that's occurred to me uh, it's, 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 well, I'll almost say know thy enemy, but you know, I, I've been an Apple guy and now a Google guy for so long, you know, I just, I'm really, you know, I, I, I remember Apple in the dark days, you know, when it was Microsoft actually that made the investment that really helped, you know, keep them alive. And I just, I just have not been a fan of windows systems for a really long time. So it's going to take a lot for me to, come over to, to, to that world and that universe. But I find it fascinating. And one of the articles we'll talk about a little bit later as far as Chrome and containers, you know, it's just this idea of being able to run uh, different software platforms on top of other, uh, of other platforms. And I, I have to say, I can't imagine Apple allowing, I mean, we do have the Google Home application. And I have, real, I have been enjoying, because we've had girls having friends over and Apple TV had to get moved or whatever. And I've just, spent a little bit more time with the Chromecast, really enjoyed the functionality of being able to put my Flickr albums on there and just turning it on in the morning in, in the bedroom and saying, oh, isn't that nice? And so anyway, we do have Google Home, but it's not at all the integrated experience that Siri is. And I can't imagine Apple, you know, allowing you to basically forego Safari, their browser, and... Um, and Siri, you know, in, in lieu of something else. But Android, again, is, we've talked about this, it's been a while on the show, but there's this massive competition that's happening between um, a more open approach towards computing and and software, and then a much more, you know, closed and gate-kept um, approach. And so who wins in the end is not, as it always is, not just a case of who writes the better code or who, you know, has the better product. It's going to be uh, a lot to do with market share and 
you know, uh, I, I don't know, the march, the march of technology things, uh, the bar just rises in terms of capabilities and things become more and more similar. So not going to convince me. Um, if we did have I, the little story I had told a few I don't know, months ago was about uh, Tommy Snyder, our uh, debate coach and part-time IT guy who had a Windows phone and had shown me its capability of plugging into his HDMI desktop monitor, you know, and potentially being a full-blown OS system just coming off of his phone. That kind of functionality is going to impress me, but I am not enticed by the prospect of running Microsoft Outlook. In fact, that causes me to have some you know, rather negative responses, so. Yep. Well, and I'll add a couple other pieces to this. Um, uh, first, uh, the Microsoft Outlook app has also been called by some Android commentators as the best mail app on uh, on Android, including accessing you know Google uh, accounts and other third party accounts. But the one thing I, I do want to say is that. Um, I have a training partner. His name is Mike Agostinelli. I work with him at the Digital Academy. We work in context of our work with the Northwest Council for Computer Education. We get asked a lot: should you know, should I go Google? Should I go Microsoft? And I don't think that 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 decision is left enough in teachers' hands, and it's oftentimes made externally to you. But with the advent of Office 365 and now the integration of mobile apps on Android and, and iOS exam, or, or, or iOS phones for that ex, uh, that matter too. There is, a, you know, you can be productive in, in both ecosystems now. I think Google got a really, really, really big lead early on with cloud-based computing and cloud-based office applications. Uh, Microsoft was slow to catch up, and I would still say that there are ways the Microsoft uh, platform outshines Google and the way that Google outshines the Microsoft platform. But the bottom line is, is that I wouldn't say they're functionally the same, but they both have enough functionality that you could be very productive in an educational context with either. And now that Microsoft is really committed, I think, to creating a, a phone layer over an Android phone so that you can become you know, proficient in both in a mobile way, I think that's a very impressive uh, a feat on their part. And again, I can't imagine, because I'm so steeped in the Google universe at work, that I would move towards um, you know, a Windows phone environment for my general mobile computing, but I'm very happy that it's available, and I'm also very happy that it's available to those that are in Office 365 districts. So um, I, I wouldn't know if that's a top story or not, but certainly something interesting that I've kind of stumbled upon. All right. Well, hopefully we haven't lost any of you who are not, you know, rabid uh, followers of the, of the Windows uh, in, environment. But we are equal opportunity uh, ed tech analysts here. So you're, you're not just going to hear one side, whether that's Apple, Android, Microsoft, or Amazon. So on the phone topic, which isn't really an article, but I'll just mention it. And I was chatting with Peggy George in the chat room. Shout out, Peggy. Uh, I've updated to iOS 11 on both my iPhone and my iPad had since our last show and have been overall pleased with the, the look and feel, uh, lost some app functionality, which I knew was going to be the case because if app developers have not, uh, you know, updated for 64 bit architecture, then they're now dead in iOS 11. Um, the, <laughs> the most impactful thing in, at school, we have two fun little apps that let you take a picture and make a, um, a like a talking, um, a talking picture. Basically we, we're doing this with puppets in our, uh, Tuesday afternoon after school steam studio. And so one is called, uh, yak at kids. And then the other one is called, oh gosh, I'm going to have to pull it up. Um, yak at kids is the one that is dead. Um, this other one is not dead and it is, I'm going to have to see, um, flip back in my active apps to go back. Gosh, I quit all my apps. Look at that. Anyway, it's, um, th that was just, that was one app that we weren't able to run on the iPad this last week because it's been, um, has been discontinued. But uh, the, the number one thing that I've run into, and I'll find the name of this app and mention it here, is just a password glitch. And so this is a shout out to anyone, uh, Ben Wilkoff or others who uh, may have run into it. I've read documentation of other people experiencing it as far as a sync issue with your Apple ID. And I literally wasted about an hour and a half of my life last night just with my iPad trying to get that resolved. And I finally reset the settings and that seemed to do the trick, but Apple TV is asking for the login. I've reset my password. It's not taking it. It's happening on my, my office uh, Mac, you know, as well as laptop. 
So anyway, that is a bit irritating and I'm not sure, you know, what's causing that kind of a sync issue. It's almost like I need to, you know, log out everywhere and then, then log back in. But um, that's a little a quick update. And one other thing I'll say is we're continuing to do some workshops with teachers about two-factor authentication. I uh, learned this last week. Apparently, two-factor does not work on pre-iOS 8 devices. So if you know anyone who's running, for instance, a, an iPhone 4, which... I think will not take iOS 8. It just doesn't appear at all to accept two-factor, uh, and you can't run the Google app. We also ran into this with an Android user who had, a, I think, a Samsung phone, and there was a native mail app that he was using, but that wouldn't, wouldn't work with, um, with two-step. Um, that wasn't a problem because he was able to download Gmail, and Gmail worked fine. But anyway, these different uh, security issues and things that we run into are... Uh, a sign of the times. And one of the things with iOS 11, uh, it doesn't have the built-in integration with Twitter and Facebook. In fact, I took a, a screenshot today that I, I saw contacts are no longer uh, updated by Facebook. So we used to have, I don't know if that, that's not even going to be readable, um, your Facebook contacts as far as birthdays and other information, their pictures and things like that. And so uh, tech companies are looking at how they can um, you know, kind of isolate and, and limit the damage, I guess, that things can cause as far as interoperability and, and also for authentication. And uh, as we talk about Facebook tonight, um, there's, there's some really important security things to keep in mind in terms of the number of places you may have authenticated uh, on mobile phones and devices and apps too, right? Because some, some of us can, tend to get a little app happy and try out a bunch of things and you may have forgotten, oh yeah, I logged into such and such. And, you know, if that company would be hacked, which is, is sadly not an unrealistic thing in terms of how many, you know, tech companies are out there, you know, there is potential for passwords and for credentials and things like that to be taken. So I will just say that I hope the ongoing development of Android as well as iOS is going to, you know, continue to become more secure for users and that we're going to find ways to, you know, reduce the risks that we continue to hear about all the time when it comes to uh, security because our our reliance on these things just continues to grow. And I would add a couple things about iOS 11. Um, that you would be now an additional person I know that's had issues since upgrading. Uh, my wife has had issues um, uh, and her phone has become basically not responsive some ways in the, t in the, in the touch screen after the update. Um, we're thinking about resetting your phone, but of course that you know comes with its own problems as uh, it's a little better than it used to be with cloud storage of things, but data loss, et cetera. Um, uh, my friend Mike at work uh, and my partner in crime on training, he is a, 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 a uh, iPhone 7 user and upgraded and has had problems getting to the menu the, the with the flashlight and the, I don't know if there's a formal title for that. And after quick, I have quick, quick launch menu, maybe. Yeah, the quick launch menu. And then I also uh, updated my my um, iPad mini 2 to iOS 11. And although I felt it was a lot crisper and felt uh, like the functionality was better, I can't consistently get to the quick launch menu either. So, um, yeah, interesting. And, you know, I, I think part of it is that, you know, Apple's committed to, to support older devices. In the case of my, my iPad mini 2, it's a four-year-old device and I, I love it, but it is a dated retro device at this point. And I do think that, uh, you know, that the quality control aspect of the, of the, the uh, releases of these operating systems um, are an extraordinary challenge, but we rely on these phones for everything. And so if you update it and it borks your phone, that's a bad deal. Here's a weird thing too that, uh, and Peggy's asking in the, in the chat if I found a good article as far as resolving issues. I haven't, but I will, I'll specifically look for those and, and put those in show notes for, for next week um, because I know I'm going to be working on this in, the, in upcoming days. The keyboard for iOS 11 has changed in some interesting ways, and I've never had this happen before, but with my Apple ID, and I, maybe I'm not positive this was an issue, but it appeared that a special character that I had used, have, they've moved around and they're not up above the, the numbers. And so I would think a special character is a special character. But anyway, in my, in my uh, journey of trying to figure out my login issues, I ended up um, you know, changing that password and that character. And so anyway, it's just bizarre. So yeah, shout out to anybody who has 
uh, solve some of those issues. If you've run into some good ones, normally with with all the tech pundits, you know, writing about updates and things like that, you can get some some pretty uh, quick answers. Shout out to a new guest, I think, in our chat room, Scott Summer. So it's great to have you with us, Scott. And feel free to chime in with uh, questions or commentary that you would have for us. Okay, all right. So where to next? My turn. Um, let's see. I think I want to take us to. Um, one that I put under the, the title of Google. This is from uh, TechCrunch on October 19th. Two Google alums just raised $60 million to rethink documents. Uh, and so the, these are two MIT graduates, and they both uh, left jobs at Microsoft and Google. And they are, are trying to create kind of a new document category. Their company is called Coda. And rather than thinking about this is a spreadsheet, this is a document, the quote is, we like to describe it as a new document that blends flexibility of documents, the power of spreadsheets, and the utility of applications into a single new canvas. It really started from an observation that we think the world is full of all these different types of applications, but most work gets done on documents and spreadsheets. Every team we've looked at, we ask them what they use to run things, and they list different applications, so CRM, task trackers, et cetera. So I think this is really cool and exciting, yeah. you know, and, and sometimes, I don't know, do you, do you know anybody... Uh, Jason, who believes that computer literacy should still mean Microsoft Office exclusively, and that's what we need to do in school. Is anybody like that at all in your world or in Mon uh, the state of Montana? Yeah, I, I run across a person or two occasionally that believes that. And and it, where I usually run into this debate is regarding, you know, should we be teaching Microsoft Office or, or should we be teaching Google Apps when Microsoft Office is so dominant in the enterprise? I'd like to remind folks that if... Um, you know, the office we used in high school sealed you in forever. That means I would need to find WordStar for DOS 5.0. So I, uh, that's the, the word processor I used almost exclusively up until I, you know, picked up a Windows 3.1 machine in college and started moving towards that ecosystem. Because the bottom line is, is that computers evolve fairly quickly as do the office suites. But I really like that interesting notion that we do spend a lot of time teaching about apps, but a lot of the world's work, and I'm gonna put work in quotation marks because that means a lot of different things, does happen in a more traditional office suite environment. And I know, you know, a lot of my day is spent in spreadsheets and in documents when I'm creating, even though I have lots of opportunities in my job to do creative things and to build things from scratch, which is the best part of my job, there's still a lot of interesting things I have to do in the office suite. And so any effort to add in something new and interesting to that environment, I think is very laudable. And I, I'm looking at the screenshots in the TechCrunch article you shared, and it's got a very kind of Google Docs feel to it, but it also seems to be, you know, trying to wrap in more uh, connectivity into a, a document. It kind of reminds me of uh, 10 or so years ago, Google tried to introduce a new communication platform called Google Wave. And it was one of those things that the nerds super jumped on top of it. I was super excited about it. In fact, I, I worked with some students on on trying to figure out if we could use Wave as an educational platform just in time for Google to shut it down right. quickly after their introduction. But I think any effort into trying to make documents a, a, a more innovative experience, because I do think it's true, a lot of productivity, a lot of work happens in those more traditional of environments. Well, there's a really important point to make here in terms of, of the educational lens, the classroom lens, and, and that is what we try to do here on the show is take a look at some recent articles and news and, and think about how that applies within schools. You know, we don't want to be pushing the bleeding edge newest, you know, out to everybody. Uh, there's a, a definite space for early adapter innovators to be experimenting with things, but as, as an example with iOS 11, um, we're not updating our iPads at school to it yet. We're holding off. Um, they have come out now with, I think, three iterations of updates. It was like 11, I think it's 11.0.3 um, is the, the one that I've installed this, this week. And, you know, there can be a cost for updating on the bleeding edge. One of the things we tell our users you, typically with laptops, you know, is to wait, let us test it because <laughs> most of the time it breaks printers. We have Canon multifunction and I don't know if that's just something with Canon, but, you know, we, we kind of tell people upgrade at your own risk because you know, we, we can't go around and just, you know, push out printer drivers. 
one of the documents, and I don't have this in the in the show notes, but I'm I've got to read it. Apple has a new deployment guide, and I say new, maybe it's been out for a few months, but you know the new model of uh, of managing devices is is all through mobile management. It's not through going going through and touching all these machines and, and individually, you know, having to reimage them and having to you know just reinstall things fit by physically touching devices. It's it's doing things over the air and over the network and things like that. So that's on my reading list for upcoming weeks, and um, I I think it's just a cautionary tale for folks, you know. Think about what your you know, absolute productivity machines are, and you know, it may be a good idea to, to delay that. Um, I know that I, 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 this hasn't bit me in a while because I've migrated to mostly cloud-based solutions, including like invoicing and things like that uh, for the, the limited consulting you know, that I still do. Uh, by the way, Jason and I are available for hire, so just put a plug out there. Um, but, you know, that that's bit me before where I'm like, oh, great. It's, you know, iOS 9 point whatever. And then, ah, but that means my such and such program doesn't run. So a little bit less of an issue. Things running in the cloud help us there. Um, but it is definitely something you've got to decide, you know, as a technology director or, or someone who is responsible for, for tech in your area, it's going to be, you know, when do we update and, and being aware of apps that, you know, you might lose uh, or some functions. So I just, I think it's generally good to have some devices you can test with, but not your production machines until you, you know, verify that core functionality, you know, heaven forbid we can't print. I mean, it, it is, it's seriously important in a lot of contexts. Um, and so we got to be careful with that kind of stuff in terms of pushing that out. Yep, absolutely so. Um, let me go over one other quick Google article on here because it's, it's interesting and it may impact folks that are in the Gmail universe. Um, Google has announced that they are now allowing add-ins to the Gmail platform. And for those of you unaware of add-ins, if you go to any of the Office products, including the word processor or spreadsheet or presentation software, add-ins have been a part of their environment for I think the last two years or so. And I love them. They're super great. Um, they allow you to, to extend the functionality of um, uh, the particular app, and now they allow that in Gmail as well. And I have to say, I did go in this morning and look. The add-ins available round one are are not super impressive. They're they're mostly uh, CRM or customer relation management software related pieces. I'm sure that's really great for enterprise sales groups. Not so great when it comes to running a state virtual school, um, as I help do uh, during my day job. But I did want to mention that Google is adding that uh, plug-in architecture or add-in architecture to allow some extensibility um, in this environment. So good on Google for continuing to innovate in that space. One more Google plug. Uh, we are going to have, week after this, our first G Camp OKC. Yay. And we're, uh, well, I've got a little over 100 folks registered. We've got 21 presenters and folks from Kansas and over around Oklahoma. And I'm just really excited about the uh, different presentations that we're going to have. Uh, perhaps most exciting, we're going to be having amazing smoked uh, chicken and ribs that um, we we're, we have the good fortune of being able to to borrow the Oklahoma Pork Council's smoker at our school. And so perhaps that will, I mean, hopefully the learning will be the highlight, but you know, it never hurts to combine good learning with, with good food. Um, and actually I'll, I'll ask a related question, Jason. So we don't have a designated keynote speaker. We've been talking about, you know, do we do, you know, like an app SmackDown, Google extension SmackDown kind of thing. My wife is pretty adamant we shouldn't call it an app SmackDown because she thinks of, you know, iPads and apps with that, you know, or should it be a, a hybrid, um, you know, set of uh, of maybe Ignite or, you know, kind of uh, Pecha Kucha, just short, short little presentations. What what do you think? I, I think we should leverage the, the the knowledge of the room and the crowd, right? Because we're going to have a lot of folks who are, you know, certified Google innovators and, and just doing cool stuff. What, what, what suggestions would you have for that kind of format? Because the way we've set that up, that will be right before lunch and it'll be in the cafeteria, which is not an ideal venue, but we've got our musical going on in our auditorium. So any thoughts about what we might, what we might do with that kind of keynote time, but it could become something more egalitarian and crowdsourced, you know, with more input from more people. Sure. Uh, the last time I did something like that, it was short four minute presentations um, that shared kind of your most interesting tip you can add a Google twist to that and say, show us your 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 best three-minute Google magic. 
And uh, what's great about that is that it sounds like with the crowd that you're going to have in the room, you're inevitably going to find half or more of the things are things people have never heard of before. That's a little esoteric part of the Google world that someone that's really steep in the universe would be you know, best able to to demonstrate. So I, I love the, the short presentation piece, especially when, you know, you can you can do a, a, a tip or a piece of magic, right? So that, you know, kind of guaranteed someone will leave something with maybe something they haven't heard of before. Right. Um, I think that's a that's a great format. Okay, that sounds good. Well, if anybody else has suggestions, uh, uh, Peggy or Scott or anybody else as far as what we might call that, uh, but yeah, Google Tips are trying to make it, you know, lowering the bar of, of the fear factor you know, as far as people sharing. So, okay, yeah, awesome. that sounds good. Well, uh, let's do another article that has a Google connection to it, um, but it's but it's an AI connection. And so we have talked about on the show how uh, there's this group called DeepMind that created something called AlphaGo. And it's been a number of years that a computer defeated, um, you know, the world's, one of the world's chess champions. Uh, but AlphaGo had the distinction of beating pretty decisively uh, a, a very high-level Go champion. And Go is a much more complex game, has mu many more possibilities, and you know, it just really stunned the world who's aware of Go, you know, that this computer was not only able to beat the human, but was able to figure out new strategies and new, you know, approaches that human beings hadn't even done. And so, you know, human beings have now gone to school on what that computer has done. Well, the link that I put in here is a, a blog post. It's called AlphaGo Zero, Launching from Scratch. And the authors of this are... Um, the uh, the founders of uh, AlphaGo, well, I guess D uh, Demise um, Hasselis is the co-founder and CEO of DeepMind, and then David Silver is a research scientist with DeepMind. We've talked about on the show, and this is something Google has emphasized in their last two events. They've said, we're moving from a mobile-first strategy to an AI-first strategy. And, and we really should pay attention when a company like Google says they're changing you know, their overall strategy of what they're doing as a company. And so what has happened with this AlphaGo Zero? All they had the first AlphaGo uh, spend several months and analyze what human players would do. In three days, AlphaGo surpassed the ability of the original. And um, well, let me let me actually get a get a quotation. So um, here's how it here's how it differs. Well, that's not the right quote I wanted to do. Ba basically. Um, yeah, previous versions of AlphaGo initially trained on thousands of human amateur and professional games to learn how to play Go. AlphaGo Zero skips this step and learns to play simply by playing games against itself, starting from completely random play. In doing so, it quickly surpassed human level of play and defeated the previously published champion defeating version by 100 games to zero. And so this is pretty stunning. Now, this isn't, you know, um, Skynet. This isn't, you know... AI has taken over the world and we all need to, you know, move into our, uh, our uh, shelters in the, in the backyard and, you know, get, get, get loaded up with ammunition and whatever kinds of uh, MREs that'll, you know, sustain us for the, for Armageddon. It, it, this isn't that, but this is incredible artificial intelligence unleashed. And in seeing such a dramatic increase so quickly after this stunning announcement of, Oh my gosh, look what AlphaGo has done. I, I mean, we're just glimpsing a little bit into this world of why Google says they're moving into an AI first world. So, Jason, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I, I guess I'm not going to take up Go now. I think it's just start off with <laughs> there will always be someone better than me in the form of probably my smartphone. But um, I'm really interested by the notion of uh, it playing itself uh, to learn how to become a master at the game. And I remember. Uh, and this is you know, total, total geek trivia, the movie War Games, the 1984 mm -hmm. movie War Games, and um, they, they built a computer, the Whopper uh, was the name of the computer in War Games, and the way the Whopper became smarter about strategy was playing itself in simple strategy games like tic-tac-toe and then more, you know the, the famous line at the end of the movie was that uh, you know like tic-tac-toe, 
global thermonuclear war is a game that you can't win, so the best strategy is just not to play. But that's what I keep thinking about is that it's funny the Whopper is here and it's beating nerds at Go, right? So um, I, I think there's something really interesting about that. But, um, you know, I, in a world where people have, you know, less cynicism about artificial intelligence than maybe they should, take stock in the fact that it can play itself through scenarios and become smarter at strategizing over something like a game than you are as human. So don't underestimate that this could be a risky move having us unleash the machines into our world. And we need to be preparing today for the use of these AIs, which, for instance, are phenomenally better at pattern recognition and the analysis of huge data sets, right? I think, and I, we're not doing this today at our school, but I think we need to be, and we're talking about this, you know, helping students work with tools where they uh, do some analysis on some really large data sets and then bringing to bear you know, the technologies which we can to identify patterns and to visualize them and to, to pull things out that we couldn't see before. I really think it's like the calculator, and I won't tell the whole story, but I probably shared it on the show before. My dad was uh, teaching math at the Air Force Academy in like 1971 or two, and he was on the committee, you know, that looked uh, at whether they should uh, replace the slide rule. Have I told this story before? So anyway, they spent a long time, you know, debating this and they decided to stick with the slide rule for another year. You know, let's postpone the calculator. And eventually, of course, that, you know, became the norm. And, you know, I think my class was, we were the, you got issued a computer at the Air Force Academy. We were the first to get the three and a half inch floppy drive. No hard drives yet, you know, but we didn't have the big five and a quarter inch. Anyway, it's taken a long time, I think, for math teachers, for parents, for a lot of folks in education to get our heads wrapped around when is the calculator appropriate and, you know, to be able to say, okay, whatever, you know your times tables, but, you know, now at this point, you can use this tool because in the real world, we, we use tools and we use calculators. And so AI, um, hopefully, you know, if the vision of Elon Musk and others that support the open AI consortium comes to pass, is not going to just be limited to something in the hands of wealthy corporations and, you know, um, you know, dictators or, or you know, the, the security agencies of, 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 of all kinds of countries. I mean, it's going to be something that we're going to have access to as well. So I don't know. This, this is an article whose gravity and impact I think we're only, you know, dimly seeing through a very hazy room. But, you know, when you look at this graph that they have showing, you know, how quickly AlphaGo is learning, um, it's, it's stunning. And, and that's beyond exponential. It's almost a vertical curve, you know, uh, for the first three days. And so if you've got ideas about what the implications of this are, you know, set us, set us straight. Um, Scott uh, Summer says in the chat that they talked about how AI and programming is going to be in the future on a recent Twit podcast. And This Week in Tech, Twit is definitely a great podcast network. And uh, I, think, I think this is an example of something, Jason, like we've mentioned before. We're not hearing a lot about this in mainstream media. I mean, we're hearing about, we've had all kinds of natural disasters. We've got all kinds of political craziness, you know, happening. This is a ginormous trend that we're not hearing a lot about. And I am, and I've got to do some work on this, but I'm going to do a breakout session in the last uh, session of our Google event or our, our G Camp um, about teaching and learning in an AI first world. So I'm going to try to put some thoughts together about what this means uh, and, and, you know, what kinds of implications this should have for curriculum and classes and, you know, what we do with kids. Absolutely so. And, and and again, like we mentioned here almost every week, this is part of the reason why just a broad understanding of computer science um, is important for schools. So, And it's it's good why we get together, right? Because we get to process this. So it's not, yeah. not, not that we have all these answers, but, you know, we get right. to throw these articles out there and what do you think? And right. well, kind of turn it over because and, with some of this stuff, it's not immediately obvious what the impact and implication should be tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that, and and this is maybe a, a you know a little in the weeds about us producing this podcast, but I probably listen to less podcasts now, partly because I or at least less tech podcasts because 
um, you know, we we talk and process these things. And so if you are not hosting your own at Tech Podcast at home, one of the things you should do is start try, strike up this conversation with your colleagues. And even if it seems silly to be talking about the robot invasion, if you're busy teaching, you know, uh, uh, literature at, at your high school, I do think that that even if you are a tech advocate, you, you need to be kind of thinking through uh, the, the broader perspective here. And I think obviously there's an educational focus here, but understanding and, and, and kind of pushing through these technology topics is a pretty pretty important thing. So Scott has, by the way, uh, thrown in a, a link. I'll put it in. This was kind of cool. They've changed the um, – normally you have to be knighted a moderator to, to share links. Now if somebody puts one into the chat, a moderator sees a show and hide – uh, option. Um, so, but I, I think that might have been a, a broken link. So I dropped it in. It's a Wired article from May 2016, and it says, "Soon we won't program computers; we'll train them like dogs." The end of code, um, and that's from Wired, and that's uh, a pretty interesting article. Which I don't know if we've we've covered that before, but it's yeah, who knows what the future holds. I, I do think it's going to, it's going to involve security where it's going to involve some coding at some level. Uh, does everybody need to know how to code in C plus plus and work at the command line? No, I don't think so. Uh, we're going to be able to, even as we can today work with graphical interfaces and, you know, do some, some pretty uh, uh, powerful and amazing things. So Jason, should we talk about, Hacks and security? Um, sure, let's do kind of our weekly, like the world is scary uh, uh, chat. So where do you want to go first, Wes? Well, let's start with some practical. Um, I was able to, because of some of these articles we'll talk about, um, find a great p page called the Facebook Privacy Checkup. And we've talked about Google. Uh, you've done, Jason, I know a lot about Google history and you know, be, not only being aware of what we share on Google, but being able to limit you know, if, and make decisions about that. Um, Holy mackerel. I went and did this privacy checkup. I had authorized 52 apps to have my Facebook credentials. And so you're able to revoke those. And I think I pared that down to about six. Um, I enabled two-step verification, which is a hugely important thing. We've talked about this a lot on the show. We need to be turning on two-step in as, in as many places as we can. I don't know if I've got my keys nearby me, um, but I am using um, not only the Authenticator app and SMS, but I am, I'm, I did get a $10 uh, USB key. And so I was able to activate that with Facebook, um, you know, as well as Google. And so there's a link there too, to just the Facebook security and login settings. Interestingly, you can name three to five friends who could help you log in if you get logged out. And so you can designate spouse or your buddy or whatever. That's cool. I haven't seen, you know, um, Google do that. So I guess that's a real practical level to start because sometimes when we share these articles, I know it can feel a little overwhelming, like, oh my gosh, what do I do? You know, the sky is falling. Um, but let's, uh, I guess let's uh, do this article. Um, well, this is this is probably the best video I have seen in a long, long time. Just talking about cyber threats and you know things that have happened and where the where the where we are. And it's from one of my favorite political podcasts, the World Affairs Council, actually from September 11th. But it's called the Cyber Threat with Nicole Perloff, and Nicole has a forthcoming book that she's going to uh, be uh, publishing a little bit later in this year. And um, she's interviewed by Kim Zetter, whose book is called Countdown to Zero Day, Stuxnet and the Launch of the World's First Digital Weapon. And Stuxnet is one of those things that everybody should know about and most people don't. Um, that was the probably Israeli and US CIA co-developed um, uh, malware that infected the Iranian uh, nuclear refinement facility and caused the, the facility to, to spin up instead of you know blowing it up with bombs it was destroyed by a cyber weapon but Nicole Perloff is the um, author of this forthcoming book this is how they tell me the world ends and she covers uh, cyber for the New York Times uh, as well as you know for some from some other uh, uh, journalist outlets so that's just a, a shout out to a really good overview of of where we are with cyber and how, you know, we've got people that are trying to say, Hey, the sky is falling. The sky is falling all the time. And I don't, I don't want us to fall into that, you know, for the show. Um, but 
what she says in the podcast is true. You know, a year or two ago, things that people were saying would happen. Again, I've got my, oh, they threw away my tinfoil hat. It's not here. I don't know what happened to it. I think my wife cleaned the house. Um, you know, a couple years ago, things people said, people were like, what? That's ridiculous. And and these things have come true. So um, we, we've got some more news about ransomware. Bad Rabbit ransomware attacks multiple media outlets from CSO October 24th. Uh, hearing about, um, you know, Russian media outlets uh, confirming, you know, ransomware and how much people are having to pay and, you know, self-propagating flash updates, all these things. It ties to other topics that we've discussed about, you know, phones getting more secure, limiting, you know, the damage and the interactivity that, that things have. Uh, this one from Wired on October 20th, the Reaper botnet could be worse than the internet sharing, uh, shaking uh, Mirai ever was. And this was something that, again, we just don't hear a whole lot about, but there was the largest denial of service attack ever in the history of planet Earth. A denial of service attack, if you're not familiar with it, is basically when um, hackers have a lot of devices that are on the internet that are capable of pinging or just sending a packet request out to a particular address. And so you have a flood of millions and millions of these that essentially shut down services. And you had some really significant services that got shut down and it used something called the Mirai botnet, which was an internet of things botnet. So it wasn't just like unpatched Windows XP computers and things like that. It was surveillance cameras and, and things in people's homes that had been compromised. And so this Reaper IoT botnet is saying it's already affected a million networks. And so there are lots and lots of, you know, routers and um, this is a quote from the article. The main differentiator here is that while Mirai was only exploiting devices with default credentials, this new botnet is exploit exploiting numerous vulnerabilities in IoT devices, and it's basically hacking the passwords in order to, you know, uh, sit there and it and it it's like a zombie where, and this is why they call them zombie botnets. You know, once these things are compromised, it sits there waiting for its its overlord to say, "All right, attack." You know, and whether it's an offshore gambling website or it's the nation of you fill in the blank that wants to be attacked, you know, your router, uh, your net, ca your net cam, uh, your smart TV, there's all kinds of things that can be hacked. So what we're seeing here is, you know, laying the groundwork for additional attacks and the need for us as we purchase things to have an eye on security, to update things, and honestly, to also turn stuff over. You know, we've had our, our Apple router for a long time and I have updated it, you know, a few times. Uh, and I don't know that Apple's on the list of these things that are being affected. But anyway, those are a couple of security articles and definitely a big shout out to that World Affairs Council podcast because it's phenomenal. I listened to it, but there's also a video of it that you can see as well. Okay, where shall we go next? You want to talk Mac Mini? I think you dropped that one in. That's exactly what I wanted to say. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Jason Snell from Six Colors, uh, which is an Apple-focused blog, and it has a lot of different properties and podcasts that go with it, is reporting that Apple is setting hints that there may or may not be a update to the Mac Mini. And for those of you unaware of the, the Apple hardware uh, universe, um, their desktop offerings are threefold. There is the iMac, which is the all-in-one. Um, it's been around for some time. It was kind of the uh, 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 ubiquitous uh, iMac, uh, very popular in schools with, with a lot of creatives. There's the Mac Pro which is a desktop computer. It used to be the big, monstrous, aluminum Mac Pro. We used to call it the cheese grater Mac because it had a, a, a kind of an industrial design that was very reminiscent of a cheese grater. And then there was the Mac Mini, which was a smaller machine. In fact, my first Mac was a Mac Mini. Before I ever had a Mac laptop, I had a Mac Mini that I experimented with to learn the Mac um, interface. And unfortunately, the Mac Mini has not been updated with even hardware specs for the last three years, which means that they are selling Mac Minis with fairly dated hardware. Now, I got to say, the hardware that's available now, and you can buy refurbished ones for 
lot cheaper um, is more than good enough for most computing tasks on um, uh, for, for most users. So I think that part of the desire here is not just to upgrade the hardware uh, spec wise, it's also to upgrade the form factor. And what Mr. Snell argues in his article is that he hopes that they will adopt the Apple TV uh, look to a Mac mini. So a little tiny device that, that has enough computing power in it to be a successful desktop machine. And I personally would very much like if they went into this direction. Um, I am not in the market for a Mac Pro, I really wanted one of the what's so-called garbage can Macs, the Mac Pro that, that was introduced three years ago, but that remains wildly out of my price range. And I considered actually buying a Mac Mini when we were doing uh, uh, computer updates at work. I decided to go with a, a different platform altogether instead. But uh, if they did update the Mac Mini both in specs and by form factor, I do think they would continue to find a lot of audiences, especially in schools. In fact, I know some IT directors that have bought Mac Minis, not even for Macs. They bought them to install Windows on and manage it as Windows devices because they love the form factor so much. So I guess to start with, Wes, have you used a Mac Mini uh, as a as, uh, uh, computer user before? Absolutely. Not at home, but we use several of them still today at school. We've got them in conference rooms with wireless keyboards and mice. It's great to just have that machine there available if somebody doesn't want to you know, hook up their laptop. And we've also, uh, even just in the last year, updated again. We use it to re-image machines, and then we run a caching server. So uh, Apple now has their server software available for free. And so we, we cache updates. So for instance, iOS 11 or whatever the latest one is, I mean, it's over a gigabyte, right? And if everybody is downloading that over your internet pipe, that can have a significant impact on your bandwidth and connectivity. So when you have a caching server and you have it turned on for discoverability, then folks who are connecting via wired or wireless, however you have that set up, are able to pull that update locally over your local network. And so that has been a great thing um, at our school and I would love to see the Mac Mini live on as well because as the article points out, you know, Apple's not making a ton of money from it, but it really fits some, some niche uses and it's, it's a great form factor and, you know, there's a, a handful of different Windows computers that are, are, are fitting into that as well, but to be able to run the Mac and, and you know, take care of some of those things, you know, the caching server alone with, with not just iOS devices that we own as a school, but all the iPhones that people, you know, bring, it's, it's really a big deal to be able to have those updates, you know, not, not download through our internet connection, but, you know, they do the first time, but after that, they, they pull locally. So I would commend that to anybody. And I don't, at one point I, I had a fantasy about having a, a home media server and ironically, what's what's happened now is there's this program called Plex, P-L-E-X, and my sister and brother-in-law who live up in Liberty, Missouri, um, you know, share their library with us. And so we have access to hundreds of movies uh, via Apple TV, and it, you know, streams over their, their Google Fiber connection at their house. It's crazy. So I don't foresee myself going into the home media server uh, Net, you know, being being a, a member of that club at any point soon. But I, I feel your pain. The new iMacs look wonderful, but oh my gosh, you know, the high-end ones are, you know, beyond, I think, where the trash can Mac was, right? So... Yeah. Yeah, the black iMac uh, that that's that's being dubbed the professional iMac. Uh, it's supposed to be released later this year, and I've seen configurations well into the five figures, and that's just not. That's just that's just not a game I play. So I prefer lots of cheap laptops, as uh, I've mentioned in in the past, as opposed to a super duper 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 one. That wouldn't even be one. I mean, I I have a little more flexibility at work, and I couldn't even imagine pitching to the boss a a five figure computer. So I just I would get laughed out of the office. So. Um, you know, yeah, it, 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 I'm, I'm glad to hear they're going this direction, and I'd love to see some high-end Mac minis at the twelve, thirteen hundred dollar range that have fast i7 chips and sixteen gigabytes of RAM. I think that would be a real winner. Couple of fast articles here as we're approaching the top of the hour. We did start a little bit late, so we may go a bit past the top. But I put this under other exciting tech news that's not scary. Um, Seesaw has added activities to its classroom app, and this is from actually their blog on October the fifth. 
And uh, Seesaw, as you may know, is a wonderful app for creating digital portfolios and being able to archive student work and have students show what they know. And I just, it's been a game changer in the iPad media camps that I've led the last couple summers. It is stunning how many pieces of media and quality media, you know, teachers in three days are able to share using that platform, whether they're on their iPad or they're on their laptop. And so activities is interesting because Seesaw is a very open container in terms of you can share text, you can share images, you can share audio, and then you can, you know, annotate on those things and add your voice. Um, but the activities, it makes it a little more schooly, but it is allowing for the first time for teachers to see who has turned in what, you know, in the same way that Google Classroom has. And it also allows parents, because that's one of the best things about Seesaw, Parents can opt in to get a text message and or email when something's added to their child's portfolio. Um, they can actually see the original assignment and then they see, you know, what their student or their child has created as well. Uh, sometimes it's a little mysterious to say, okay, what was going on here? Um, so that's, that's an exciting development and uh, we continue to have some really good um, traction with the use of our technology tools at school, I think, thanks to um, Seesaw. Uh, let's see, it sounds like there's one other one I wanted to mention, and then maybe you can comment on the Chromebook Nation container stuff. Um, at the very top, I put uh, this week in electricity news, there was an interesting science alert article, transparent solar cells like this could deliver 40% of America's power. This was from October 24th. And this kind of stuff comes in, I mentioned these before, I use these teaching STEM as curiosity links with students, you know, what do you think about this? And a writing prompt and a discussion. Uh, but these solar cells just look like pieces of glass and they are not yet nearly as efficient as a traditional solar cell. But, you know, the trajectory, if you want to think about graphs and interpreting graphs, look at the price of solar and where that's, you know, going. And, you know, year over year, I was, I think, listening to an NPR this week that was saying, we still have people putting these in their homes where they're a little bit more on the stick it to the man as far as their utility company side of things. They're not having this clear return on investment that just within a few years, you're going to get your money back. But I, I think they were saying like a 9% year over year reduction in costs. It's incredible. And so I'm very energized just as a, as a consumer and citizen by this potential that in the next five to 10 years, I think all of us, if we want to, would have an opportunity to legitimately either completely go off the grid or, you know, partially go off the grid as far as being able to supplement or replace our electricity needs in our, in our homes if we would want to with, with electricity. And on that note, especially since this has a Montana connection, a small Montana firm that until before Maria hit only had two employees now has a $300 million contract to uh, fix all of Puerto Rico's electrical grid. And evidently, Whitefish is the, the hometown of our interior secretary, who they say does not have any connections to this group. But it's a, it's a weird, weird kind of thing. So anyway, a couple articles there. If you want to share those with your kids, you can take those in different directions. But um, it's exciting to see the progress that we're seeing technologically. And again, in terms, oh, this was the other thing from that article. If you'd like to go work in Puerto Rico, and you have, you know, if, if you can be a lineman, the hourly wage of a lineman, let me see if I can pull this off. Uh, it's just, it's staggering. Okay, under the contract, the hourly rate is set for $330 an hour for a site supervisor. If you're a journeyman lineman, you'll be making $227.88 per hour. And the cost for subcontractors, sub which make up the bulk of Whitefish's workforce, is $462 per hour for a supervisor and $319.04 for a lineman. So for those folks that might look down their nose at the local Votex school helping people learn to, you know, work on electrical lines, not that that's going to be a job for everybody. Um, wow, $320 an hour. That's that's pretty good. So yeah, pretty solid, pretty solid. And um, of course, you know, we don't talk about this very much on the show, but the very bottom line is is that we're gonna have to find a way to power all these devices. Uh, efficiency is part of it, but that's only a small part of the game. And we we barely touched that topic here. But hopefully, you science teachers are pushing your kids to develop a solution that's gonna take the power all this crap. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You want to tackle containers now or you want to yeah. push that one on? Let, let's talk about this now and then we're going to do it sometime soon. But we, we're, we're really going to probably end up dedicating an episode at some point in the near future to Dr. Gary Steger's uh, Medium article from a couple weeks ago calling Chromebooks to task. But um, we're a fan of Chromebooks here on the show. Um, a Chromebook now from a mobile standpoint is 80% of my computing. Um, I own a couple of the different platforms. Um, and something really interesting has been happening in the Chrome world that actually hasn't got talked about a whole lot. And so we're pulling into kind of a, a somewhat technical article, but uh, Chrome Unboxed, which is an excellent blog on, on the Chrome world, um, reported uh, earlier this week that if you start to dig around a little bit into Chrome, or Chrome code, so the Chrome operating system code, you'll notice a reference to containers. And without going into the kind of varsity level nerd stuff, basically containers is part of what is starting to drive the world of applications on laptop and desktop computers. There's an element of this in iOS. There's a, well, actually it's, it's the core of iOS. It's the core of Mac OS. Uh, it's starting to, to bring in containerized applications. Windows 10 uses containerized applications. But the, the, the point here is that Chrome may be going in a direction that over the top of the simple Chrome operating system, you might be able to utilize applications from different architectures uh, running simultaneously in a multi-application system for the purpose of giving you access to Windows apps, Mac apps, Android apps, iOS apps, which is a game changer for users that would like a simple platform to utilize and then pull in applications from other ecosystems as it's necessary. One of the biggest criticisms of the Chrome uh, uh, Chrome OS world is that you're kind of stuck on the web, right? It's a fancy glorified browser. But if in a world where you could access Microsoft Word on a Word or on a Microsoft platform in a Microsoft container, or you could access Mac Photoshop, considered to be the gold standard of uh, uh, image manipulation programs, the Chrome architecture suddenly gets a lot more interesting, especially now that high-end Chromebooks are becoming part of the marketplace, right? Uh, those with great high-definition screens and USB-C ports and uh, wonderful build qualities with fast architectures and processors, suddenly there's something interesting going on here. So, Wes, obviously you've used Chromebooks. Uh, in fact, your wife until recently was primarily on a Chromebook. What does the prospect of containerized applications mean for you as an end user? I think it means the the continued improvement of IT from the the standpoint of security because yeah. one of the biggest issues is you know interoperability issues. I don't know how many of you when I say the the acronym DLL you know suddenly have a nightmare because you remember uh, grappling with DLL things and stuff like that with Windows and interoperability things. Uh, I think it's incredibly exciting. Truly, Google has revolutionized IT support in schools with the Chrome platform and the Google Admin Console. It remains to be seen whether Microsoft is going to be able to come up with something that's as compelling. I'm sure that's what they're chasing to, you know, to try to do. But, you know, being able to, uh, you know, start in eight seconds, quickly blow away your system and, and have a completely new system. And then the prospect of, of what might be, you know, more like a terminal based sort of computing environment where you're just pulling those resources down. You're still in a very light footprint, you know, computer that's running a browser, but you're able to, you know, run, run that, run these kind of, of processor intensive uh, of programs. And I, yeah, it's, it, it sounds phenomenal. There've been folks that have been, um, sort of disciples of the, the uh, thin client uh, model, you know, where you have a server running and then your computers are basically terminals that access it. And I know some schools in Oklahoma that are, that are still following that model because that's what they're, you know, I think usually outsourced IT group uh, is in favor of doing. So it's fascinating. And it, this is kind of like, it's the rumor mill, you know, how do we find out? It's a, a hint from this you know, factory in China that tells us this about the iPhone, or we see this, you know, model of, of a case. And in this case, it's a, a little snippet of code that gives us a, a hint of as far as what's to come. So I did scan the article and it's, you know, remains to be seen, but right. you know that Google has this roadmap. 
Okay, they're operating in an AI first world, and and Google, along with every other you know legitimate company out there, wants to see these security uh, issues addressed, and that's not going to be by maintaining the same kinds of architectures that we've historically had for computers. We're going to have to innovate and come up with new ways to to sandbox and protect and um, you know, is isolate things so they don't, you know, take down entire systems. So, yep. exciting. All right, shall we geek of the weekend? Let's do it. Uh, let me start, and then I'll throw it to you, Wes, to close us out. Uh, mine's a really quick one. Um, this week, or actually this, today, so I do it sooner rather than later, at woot.com, which used to be independent and is now wholly owned by the, our good friends at Amazon. Amazon Echoes Generation 1 on sale for less than half price for new devices. Uh, we reported uh, several weeks back on the podcast that there are new Amazon Echoes coming out. However, I can tell you, attest to from personal experience that the first generation is still a very great piece of hardware for nothing else, that it's a fabulous Bluetooth speaker, but you could add the Alexa uh, to your to your life. And unfortunately, I think I probably just turned on a few people's Alexa. My apologies for not calling uh, her Miss A or the Divine Miss A. Um, but the bottom line is, is that they're uh, uh, for sale. New ones are available for less than half price. I would say even as just a Bluetooth speaker to set next to your computer, let alone accessing Spotify, radio stations, and the 1,500 so-called skills of which uh, I learned a new one tonight. I played a music trivia game against some guy from Kansas, and by the way, kicked his butt. Um, but <laughs> there is a, uh, a wonderful uh, Alexa waiting for you if you're interested. So woot.com under electronics, and you can get a brand Brand new Alexa for less, or brand new Amazon Echo. I keep saying the A word. Brand new Amazon Echo. <laughs> My apologies, everyone. At least I didn't say OK, dot, 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 and the G word. Yes. Um, but uh, yes, for less than half price that, that, than they were new just a couple of weeks ago. On, on some finer tech podcasts, if uh, she who must not be named is named, they will edit that out to be courteous uh, in the interest of quickly publishing our show and not having as much time for post-production. We, we do not. So sorry about that. Uh, my, my Geeks of the Week, I got two quick ones. First one is BB Edit. It's uh, been around for quite a while. Uh, Text Wrangler is actually the thing I still use, and BB Edit's a new version. Uh, but I wrote a post this week called The Podcasting Legacy of Bob Sprankle and the Scholars of Room 208. And one of the things that uh, my friend Bob had been uh, ha asking me to help him with was, before he passed away about two years ago, um, was to preserve this Room 208 podcast that, that became pretty famous around 2005. And uh, what BB Edit or, or Text Wrangler lets you do is, uh, among many other things, grep searches, which are you know, special uh, searches that, that have special characters and commands to do things, but opening up an entire website and then doing a massive search and replace. And so in this case, um, I don't own Bob's domains. Uh, I, I bought a domain called bobtaughtme.com, and so I needed to replace that domain bobsprankle.com with this new one. And so, you know, 524 files, I think were edited in about, you know, two seconds. And that made all of the MP3 podcasts. There's about 750 megs of podcasts from 2003, four and five. I think those are the years, maybe it's 2004, five and six. Um, but anyway, just a, a wonderful tool. So introducing yourself, introducing students to the wonders of text editing and being able to batch process is a geeky thing, but it's a good thing. And that is a free application for your Mac. And then really quick, a shout out to a, a person that is uh, a, a fellow seedling with Bob, Alice Barr, who is up in, in uh, Maine. She had tweeted uh, this last week about a really, really awesome tool called Story Spheres. And so this is from Google. It's a tool for enhancing 360 degree images and it lets you position audio within a scene to create interactive experiences. And so on um, an iOS device like an iPhone, you'll actually do this with, I think, Google Street View, but you can also put these together uh, using your browser, and they've, of course, got a whole lot of things in, in galleries that you can explore, and so if you haven't played with 360-degree photospheres, it's really can be pretty amazing and uh, a way to take your kids on a virtual field trip, and even better than, I don't know, if, I think it is better than just experiencing trips that other people have created that now you can create them yourself, and I'm hopeful we've got some teachers that have pen pals in Africa and, and uh, have, have talked about doing similar kinds of things. So we may dive into some of this stuff and report back, but 
it's definitely worth checking out. Excellent. Well, uh, this is the EdTech Situation Room podcast, where you can find us on Wednesday nights broadcasting live at 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and 2 a.m. UTC. Finally have the time uh, burned apparently into my brain. Uh, we are a, a weekly podcast. Uh, if you can't catch us live, that's great. We publish the podcast out to the world at our website, edtechsr.com. You can find us on Stitcher Radio. You can find us in the iTunes podcast library. You can find us on the Spotify podcast library. You can find us on the Play Google Play podcast library or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. We encourage you to download the show weekly, or if you don't want to aggregate one, just want to listen to an audio version, we also have tiny, teeny, teeny, teeny MP3 files available at our website. Um, thank you for listening. We love to hear from you. Feedback is always available to us via Twitter at EdTechSR, or you can go to the website and provide us as much feedback or interesting bits as you like. Uh, have a great week, and we hope to see you again on the EdTech, Pes EdTech SR podcast. And shout out to Marta and Tegucigalpa. Good night. <laughs>